The machine gun did jump its course and caught the poor gunner right on the nose. And we, I gave him first aid and we called the ambulance and went in. Uh, we called it the meat wagon. Isn't that a terrible term? <laughs> and they met us there. So throughout the WASP program, you did lose some WASP pilots. Pardon? Throughout the WASP program, you did lose quite a few WASP oh, pilots. Oh, yes. We lo during the war, we lost 38 women pilots. 11 were, lo were killed at Sweetwater, an area around Sweetwater, in training, and 27 were lost in the service. Various reasons. Um, in, in 1996, after a great deal of research, in fact, I came here to uh, the base here at Maxwell Field for research We've, uh, to accumulate information about the girls and their history. Um, the book, we published a booklet called In Memoriam to the 38 Women Who Lost Their Lives in World War II. And one was a, um, my buddy, her name was Peggy Seip, and she was flying at the end of uh, training to finish up her time with her instructor and with another wasp. And um, for some inexplicable reason, on a CAVU day, uh, the plane crashed and uh, they lost all lives. But before she had died, she had had planted a garden. Uh, alongside the wall of the barracks and watered her faithfully. And on the day we graduated, September 11th, 1943, the garden was in full bloom. And I like to think that 30 years later, when the first women c continued in the flying military planes, that uh, the seeds took that long to ripen and flower with this new generation of women pilots. And you can be very proud of your women pilots. You can be very proud of your own male pilots. You can be very proud of the people who support the, the, the um, Air Force. I think you are probably, I'm full of optimism that the war somehow will find the secret way to get along with people and uh, stop sh killing people and destroying things. Build things up, why destroy? So I'm hopeful on that. And that's my, my dream, I think, for that. So all of the women Air Force service pilots had a special bond. Can you describe that bond oh, that you had? Oh, we had a special bond. I, we only knew, just face it, you're, you're, you have a squadron. You have a, a group of people in a bay, six girls. You have a small group going up to, to the flight line. You have a small group going to the PT, their canteen or the, you know. Food. And uh, you only knew a few people, actually. But you knew after the war, we bonded, we had reunions. And, uh, uh, and you were instantly connected. You'd been through the same training, more or less, and uh, you were wasps, and you uh, had that sense of fellowship, and they were your buddies. So it's a marvelous experience to this day. There was a big reunion at Sweetwater last weekend, weekend before last, and uh, 15 wasps attended. Uh, not uh, that's a good number. I think we're around 100 now. And uh, our stories are being told by the younger girls, 18 classes, and the younger girls graduated in December of 44, December 7th. They didn't have much service time. And so they're carrying on the tradition, but the women military aviators are strong, healthy, and uh, c carrying on with their stories. And as you all are here to hear stories, it's all part of our heritage. It's great. 
So you mentioned in December 1944, those wasps did not have very much time in service. No. And that was because the wasp program and ended. And that's why I was so lucky to have chosen 43.5 yeah. in that class in March rather than April. <laughs> because only a few of us were able to walk through that door for advanced training. Jackie Cochran wanted not only to have a girl fly a, a unique aircraft, but she wanted a group of women. She, her point was to prove that a group of women could fly the P-51, could fly the B-17, the B-25, the B-26, uh, P-47, P-38. Um, uh, and she proved it. And that's to her everlasting credit. Jackie Cochran was an interesting person. Uh, she had many, she was a record setter in aviation in the 30s. And her buddies and, and uh, competitors were Hap Arnold, Jimmy Doolittle, so forth. So she knew the, uh, she'd flown with them, against them in races. And of course, this was the last part of the golden age of aviation. Aviation, this, this, I, uh, are we ready for go on? Or what? Sure. You got another question? <laughs> I'm giving you too much history, aren't I? <laughs> no. Uh, this space is interesting to me because after the war was over in December, I was, you know, let go, shall we say. Uh, I was sent here with my husband uh, as a wife. And uh, we had, uh, we lived in the, mar the married officer's quarters. And, and he was in B-29 school, which was here at that time. And we, the, the whole base, I'm sure, moved downtown on the August day of 1945, when, the, when Japanese declared surrender. Uh, and it was also a part by a base where pilots and, and enlisted men and so forth were uh, disbanded from the service. And it was an interesting time. Um, we thought we'd stay in the service and then we had, had made no decision to, to get out. So I was here and um, and our friends kept leaving. And it was, all of a sudden, it was a whole different situation that had been during the war. And everybody went their own way and picked up their own lives as best they could. Uh, I was talking to our young man who's in charge of the uh, officers club today. And I was telling him that we had dances. Uh, during the year, formal dances. Girls wore long evening dresses. Everybody, you had to make your own fun. There was no television, no no communic no computers, or no little boxes, and uh, and you so you planned events. It was great. Uh, so let's fast forward about sixty years. Okay. Okay. <laughs> What did it feel like when you were when you received the Congressional Gold Medal? Oh my goodness! Congress is, you know, an interesting body of men representing us. <laughs> <laughs> Women. Congress in June of '44 decided that we were that we they wouldn't fund our program anymore. However, any girl who was accepted and was in flying status at Sweetwater could stay, and that would, so the pro, their time was up. Congress in 1977, when uh, the other women started to fly, and they said they were the first women, and then suddenly uh, our group became interested in our history. Um, had a caveat on their bill to make us veterans. They made us veterans, but not, uh, honest to goodness, um, Air Force 
personnel. Army Air Force. Oh no, it was 47. So it would be Air Force. So they little waffled there. So we jumped from being a volunteer into the service to a volunteer into the veterans organization. And then the gold medal comes along as a piece of cake after 30 some years. Uh, well, 2010, you had me, you may, you're right, it's over 50. And suddenly, uh, again, we're still veterans. We're still volunteers, veterans, and gold star. So I'm pleased. I, I was thrilled. I did several interviews at the time. And uh, here we were. We had grandchildren. Some people had great-grandchildren. They had sisters and brothers. And uh, the Congress was overwhelmed with pick people. It was the biggest audience they'd ever had for a ceremony in the uh, House of Congress. Um, it was uh, muted. It wasn't joyful. It was that sense of deep satisfaction that, yes, your country has recognized your service. And I think that satisfaction is um, kind of warming to the heart. I didn't tell you the other moment of, of, uh, of um, it was particularly interesting to me. It was when I did the night, first night solo in the B-17. And I'm making the pattern. And the, the beacon is going around its slow, steady circle. And the blue runway lights are calling. And, and all of a sudden, I realized I was a pilot. And it was that same feeling of satisfaction that you'd accomplished something. And I think that's given me um, a sense of strength all my life. And, uh, and I'm so glad to be invited here today because I really appreciate this moment with you all. So with that, what was your favorite part about flying? I love the sky and all its changes. We had a night flight uh, one time when we didn't have enough time in Columbus, Ohio, to graduate. And the, the, the powers that be decided we'd go to Houston to get better weather. And so we were in this terrible weather. The, the ice boots, they're, they're rubber boots, they're called, that are on the leading edge of the wing. And they would take the ice and crack it so it would, didn't build up ice. And then the propellers had a de-icer machine. They would keep the propellers from getting ice. And that ice from the propellers would hit the fuselage and make this real crashy noise. And all, we were in the soup there for a long time, and all of a sudden we broke through the clouds, and we're up above on the top of the, of the uh, uh, overcast, and there's white clouds. There, it was completely flat, and there's the full moon. Oh, just gorgeous. And it's, I have many memories. The coast of Florida in the afternoons, perhaps here in Alabama, uh, is lined in the afternoon with thunderstorms, just isolated unit storms. But they're, they're dangerous because they, they can go up 40,000 feet, and they're full of currents of air and so forth. And you, but, but you can fly around them. And, and there's only maybe two in a row before you get to dry land again. And here's the ocean, or the Gulf, and so forth. And as you round about one of these towers, all of a sudden you see the pilot's cross, which is a complete circle of rainbow with your airplane shadowed in the middle. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. And uh, this world is so beautiful that I... Uh, I, still to this day, when the wheels leave the runway, I have, ooh, <laughs> I'm thrilled. All right, ma'am, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to give you the opportunity if there was anything else that you would like to tell the students. Oh. It's a, it's a wonderful life. And you have so many people to thank. 
because you don't you don't do it alone. You do it through the through the kindness of other people. I'd never have gone to Cornell unless my Latin teacher had said, "You must go. Pack your suitcase. Here's fifty dollars. Harriet will drive you down to the dean of women, and, and you will find your your way." Uh, and you must take the step between thought and action, because it's only through action that you are satisfied when you're 99 years old. And I don't think I missed many opportunities, because I guess my goal was to actually to be of service uh, to my country, to my family, to my community, to myself and to, um, inspire other people, perhaps, that life is wonderful. And be happy, please. Ms. Seymour, you have truly inspired all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me recognize Ms. Dawn Seymour.